Over the past century, the pandemic of lead poisoning, a corporate collusion to extract immense profit from the sale of a poison, cast a shadow over the planet, leaving in its wake death, disease, and crime. In the 1960s, during the peak of the pandemic, hundreds of children in cities across North America died every summer from lead poisoning. Dr. Needleman found that the amount of lead in children's baby teeth, which is a good measure of a child's exposure to lead, predicted how well they did in school. Children who had higher levels of lead in their teeth were more likely to be hyperactive, impulsive, low-functioning, and distractible. To show how lead exposure increases the risk for ADHD, let's look at two schools, each with 100 students. In the first school, students have low lead exposure. About five have ADHD. In the second school, students have higher lead exposure. 13 children have ADHD, five from lead poisoning. If we apply these numbers to the entire country, about three million children have ADHD. By eliminating lead exposure, we could prevent 600,000 cases of ADHD in the United States. The levels of lead that increase the risk for ADHD and other types of brain damage are exceedingly low. In 2012, the Centers for Disease Control and the World Health Organization declared there is no safe level of lead in children's blood. This shouldn't be surprising, even though the body burden of lead has dropped by over 90% since the peak of the lead pandemic, it is still 10 to 100 times higher than our pre-industrial ancestors. Lead toxicity doesn't only impair children, it affects people over their entire life. The ability to think and reason increases as we mature, peaks during young adulthood, and then begins to decline in our 60s. Children who have higher lead exposure never reach the same peak ability as children with lower exposure. At the other end of life, adults with higher lead exposure have accelerated decline in their mental abilities and may develop dementia sooner. In a Cincinnati study, young adults who were more heavily exposed to lead during their childhood were more likely to be arrested for violent crimes. These results are mirrored in homicides over the past century. Children's exposures from lead and paint and gasoline are reflected about 21 years later by higher rates of homicides. Violent crimes declined dramatically over the past four decades in lockstep with the decline in blood lead levels. Over 50% of the decline in violent crimes was due to falling blood lead levels. All other factors, like poverty and the number of police, only accounted for 30% of the decline. Lead is also a risk factor for coronary heart disease. That's when your heart is slowly or suddenly suffocated by an obstruction of the arteries feeding the heart. In a national study, we found that deaths increased sharply at blood lead levels below 50 parts per billion, the level considered safe. There was no threshold or safe level. If we let the narrowing of this coronary artery represent the risk of dying from heart disease, you can see that most of the narrowing occurs below 50 parts per billion. We found that lead accounts for about 185,000 deaths every year. That makes lead the leading cause of fatal heart attacks in the United States. Beginning in 1892, about 20 children in Queensland, Australia were lead poisoned every year. About half of them died. After years of failed attempts to educate parents to change their children's behaviors to avoid ingestion of leaded paint, a pediatrician, A.J. Turner said, prevention is easy. Paint containing lead should never be employed where children are accustomed to play. Despite this warning, the paint industry continued to add lead to paint. Two decades later, when the lead industry was poised to add tetraethyl lead to gasoline, Yandel Henderson said, the use of lead would cause vast numbers of the population to suffer from slow lead poisoning with hardening of the arteries. Still, the U.S. government allowed companies to add millions of tons of lead to paint and gasoline. 
The lead industry knew it was toxic, yet they mounted a major campaign to deceive the public. The first crime? Failing to prevent the lead pandemic, despite the early warnings. In the 1940s, paint companies reduced the amount of lead in paint because it was needed for World War II. After the war, the petroleum industry expanded the production of leaded gasoline. They couldn't help themselves. It was too profitable. The second crime? Immense wealth at the expense of public health. You may recognize some of the corporations who profited from the sale of lead. Standard Oil, Dutch Boy Paints, DuPont, Sherwin-Williams, and General Motors. In 1967, René Dubois, a scientist, warned, the problem is so well-defined, so neatly packaged, with both causes and cures known, that if we don't end this social crime, our society deserves all the disasters that have been forecast for it. Still, the lead industry continued to add lead to gasoline, paint, canned foods, water service lines, and other consumer products. Ultimately, over 12 million tons, or 11 billion kilos of lead, was disseminated into the environment, the equivalent of over 100 Chrysler buildings. A toxic residue of lead now lingers in our cities and neighborhoods and continues to poison children. The third crime, once lead was declared toxic in affluent countries, corporations increased sales to industrializing countries. Now, over 90% of children who are lead poisoned live in industrializing countries, especially in Southeast Asia and Africa. Why does the lead pandemic deserve to be the crime of the century? It isn't only because it was the largest mass poisoning in history, exposing billions of people to a toxic metal, or that the lead pandemic was entirely preventable. It isn't only because immense wealth was made by a few at the expense of people's health, or that it is a leading but largely ignored cause of violent crimes and heart disease. The ultimate reason lead is the crime of the century is because the perpetrators of this horrific tragedy were never held accountable. In the absence of a global treaty to ban all non-essential uses of lead, countries around the world are taking steps to protect children. Denmark banned all non-essential uses of lead the Philippines and India banned lead-based paints. The city of Rochester tests houses for lead hazards before they are rented to families with children. Cities in California sued paint manufacturers to help reduce lead hazards in housing. Lansing, Michigan replaced their lead service lines. It won't be easy, but if every city and country took these steps, we could eliminate lead poisoning in the next generation.